Corinthians, uh, inching ever closer to the end of this study. I think it's been, Brother Norman mentioned Sunday night, I think we've, it's been almost, not quite, but almost a year and a half that we've been looking through all of the Scripture, um, book by book, to see what can we learn of Jesus. Jesus uh, exhorts that. We grow to be more like him as we come to know him more. And so we've given all of you that opportunity for a, about a year and a half. If you've missed that, uh, most of those messages are on our, uh, our YouTube channel and sermon audio. Uh, if you want to t study something that's specifically designed to let you see Jesus in all of Scripture. So we're wrapping that up tonight, Lord willing, uh, in the second installment on Revelation. 1 Corinthians Chapter 14, where the overarching theme of this letter is the perfect gospel for an imperfect church. If you've been with us or if you're familiar with, the, with 1 Corinthians, if you've read through it in your devotional materials, you know there were lots of problems in the church uh, at Corinth. And Paul starts out, the, out of the gate in the letter, rebuking them for, for divisiveness uh, in, the, in the outflow of that, of that church. And he's continued to address some things. And now we're in the section where he is really rebuking them, uh, having set forth, here's what the charismata are, here's what the charismatic gifts are, the grace gifts that, that everyone who's saved, when you, when you became a Christian, when you were born again, and the Spirit of God came to indwell you, he came with gifts, plural. The person who says, well, I have no spiritual gift is saying I have no hope of salvation. Because when you're saved, you're given spiritual gifts to be cultivated, to be discovered and cultivated. And so Paul did that in chapter 12. He set forth, and we looked at, at Romans and Ephesians where he stated these things. But in chapter 12, here's what they are. And in chapter 13, he said, I want to show you a more excellent way to express these. In chapter 14, he's really digging down to say tongues is way out of proportion in your congregation and it is, it is misused and distorted. And so he's making this contrast here. And we've looked at this in, in the earlier verses, 1 to 19. Now we move today to chapter 14, verses 20 to 25. Stand with me if you would. If you found that in your Bibles, we've got the text on the screen in case you don't have a Bible with you. 1 Corinthians 14, 20 to 25. You pick up the tone here. Brothers... Do not be children in your thinking. Be infants in evil. But in your thinking, be mature. In the law it is written, by people of strange tongues and by the lips of foreigners will I speak to this people. And even then they will not listen to me, says the Lord. Thus tongues are a sign not for believers, but for unbelievers, while prophecy is not for believers, but for believers. If therefore the whole church comes together and all speak in tongues, and outsiders or unbelievers enter, will they not say that you are out of your minds? But if all prophesy, and an unbeliever or outsider enters, he is convicted by all. He is called to account by all. The secrets of his heart are disclosed. And so, falling on his face, he will worship God and declare that God is really among you. What have we just read together? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. May the Lord help us to take to heart what Paul is saying, what he is teaching, what he is, what he is pressing upon the Corinthian church and stressing to them to correct this abuse that has not passed away three centuries later. And may he help us to practice the charismata, to emphasize, as, as one fellow has said, make the main thing the main thing. And that is declaring the gospel of Jesus Christ to the saved and unsaved, and then building one another up in the most holy faith. Thank you. Please be seated. 
Well, in the last section, verses 1 to 19, the apostle gave three reasons why the position of tongues is secondary to that of prophecy. He said prophecy edifies the whole congregation, tongues are intelligible, and the effects of tongues are emotional rather than rational. As we shift our focus a little bit, these next few verses, he reviews the primary purpose of the gift of, tongue, of languages and then gives the procedure, the guidelines for its proper use. This is a very important section. In fact, I would submit to you it's, it's one of the sections that's left out when you find places that put an emphasis on uh, the multisyllabic, uh, unintelligible gibberish that is promoted as the gift of tongues in, in places today. This gives some clarification what it was designed to do, what it was not designed to do. He says in 1 Corinthians 14, 5, I would remind you, now I want you all to speak in tongues. Remember we talked about the distinction that we have to hold. When he, when he mentions a tongue, he is speaking to what they're doing. When he talks about tongues, he is referencing the gift of tongues. I want you all to speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues unless someone interprets so that the church may be built up. And we pointed out to you in chapter 12, we've been showing it to you ever since, that edification, building up, encouraging, provoking one another to love and good works, that's the, that's the purpose of the charismata. That's the purpose of the spiritual gifts. And so you could observe that, that it's the interpretation of tongues that needs to attend the speaking of tongues, the interpretation of tongues, is the edifying aspect of that. Look at 1 Corinthians 12, 10. To another he gave the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the ability to distinguish different between spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. And he asked the question in, in chapter 12, verse 30, and we, we looked at this at the time, it's, they're rhetorical questions that anticipate a negative answer. So I'm gonna read it that way. All don't possess gifts of healing, do they? All don't speak with tongues, do they? All don't interpret, do they? And yet he, he mentions in the context of the legitimate expression of tongues, speaking in other languages, the importance of, the, of its, its sidekick, if you please, of the interpreting of those languages. And I remind you that he also said in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, we were all baptized uh, in the same spirit. So, so it, it dismissed the possibility of baptism in the spirit being speaking in tongues, other languages. The scripture just doesn't acknowledge that. Remember at Pentecost, you can't, you can't ever move very far from Pentecost if you want to understand what Paul is teaching here. This miracle uh, where they all heard, I've told you this before when we were studying this in a different context, it's, it's like a United Nations connection. If you've ever seen the United Nations meeting, someone is standing at the podium speaking and the representatives of other languages have these, these earpieces on and they are hearing what's being spoken by an interpreter who's in a booth who's able to hear what the speaker is saying and interpreting that into the language, no matter what country a person is from. That's, uh, Paul is referencing Pentecost, and that's what happened at Pentecost. That was the amazement. They heard the validation of the great, the mighty works of God. That's what it's going to say, and we're going to look at that. And we're convinced that the gospel was true, that Jesus Christ was indeed the Messiah, the Son of God. These are Jews at Pentecost gathered from all over the, the known world. And they believed. 3,000 were added to the church that day. There's no mention, though, of any of these 3,000 converts practicing at that moment, multisyllabic, non-intelligible gibberish, calling it tongues, and suggesting that they'd been saved or filled with the Spirit as a result of that. 
When you get on over to Acts 4.31, it says, When they had prayed, Peter and John met with some of the disciples, remember? The, we're told that the, uh, the group was filled with the Holy Spirit. Notice. When they prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak, what? The Word of God with boldness. Prophecy. They testified to the truthfulness of God's Word. And they spoke the truthfulness of God's Word to one another in that setting. This is not long after Pentecost. So today we want to think about the purpose of tongues. And as our text says, it was a sign to unbelievers. And he begins this, this text calling them to maturity. Do not be children in your thinking. What is he saying to them? Why would he even say that? If he did not think they were acting like children. And he presses on further because he says, be infants in evil. That is, be infants concerning evil. He's, he's not just saying that what they're doing at Corinth is immature, but it has evil implications. It's deadly for the life of the church at Corinth. You've got to receive this from the apostle. He was writing what he was writing on the inspiration of the Spirit, and he knew exactly what he was talking about. He knew what he was addressing. And he did not misspeak, and he did not misunderstand. And so he does this, do not be children, be babes concerning evil. So it's, it's not, it, it, he's sort of playing off of his picture here. In your thinking, be mature. In your thinking, be mature. And so he wants the Corinthians to grow up. <laughs> and here's the problem. We've talked about this before. The language he's used previously leads you to believe that, that they thought that the folks who were pushing this, this multisyllabic, non-intelligible gibberish agenda were the mature ones. Paul says no. That's immature and it's dangerous. And so he cites this, this Old Testament expression here by people of strange tongues, by the lips of foreigners. Will these things happen? We read it from Isaiah 28, this reference. You may have wondered, what in the world are we reading this passage for? And the things it's saying are not very encouraging. In the middle of that passage, he talks about these foreign, bringing people with foreign languages to them as judgment. And the whole idea of line upon line, precept upon precept, is basically Isaiah, the prophet, is saying, by the inspiration of God, you're, you're being childish. We're having, to, we're having to do this for you so carefully because you're so immature. That's what God was saying to his people then. He says, I send them with a foreign language, and they will not listen to me. That, he said, what Isaiah is saying is that didn't even shock them. Let's back up a little bit. Do you remember what happened at Babel? At Babel, they all uh, got uh, too big for their britches, basically, in Genesis, and decided that they would build a tower to heaven, that they weren't, they weren't going to wait for God to come down to them. They were a busy people. They were going to build a tower to heaven, and that way they'd have access to God anytime time they wanted to. And God confused their languages at Babel so that they couldn't communicate such a wicked idea to one another anymore, and they separated. They spread. It was a sign of judgment. Paul is citing this Having said what they're doing is what they're practicing is evil, he cites this to say, the presence of that in your midst is judgment. And so he unpacks this notion that strange tongues that are not interpreted are not a sign of blessing, 
I think it was John MacArthur in his commentary who said the gift of tongues was given solely as a sign to, the, to unbelieving Israel. And if you understand that, then this passage lays out uh, in a pretty amazingly understandable way. This passage we read in Isaiah 50, uh, 28, some 15 years before Isaiah prophesied about the strange tongues from the lips of strangers. Israel, the northern kingdom, uh, had been conquered and taken captive by the Assyrians, 722 B.C. This happened to them because of their unbelief in apostasy. You remember we studied that on Sunday night as we looked at the various, various uh, prophets. So the prophet warns the southern kingdom, Judah, that the same judgment awaited them at the hands of the Babylonians, which would happen, of course, in 586 B.C. But like their counterparts in the northern kingdom, they didn't listen to the prophet. They didn't heed the word of God. They were offended when he said that they were just like those weaned from milk. And yet God had sent a prophet to be sure that they understood what he was teaching, what he was warning. And they resented that. You ever know anybody like that? You speak to them very plainly. You take them to the, to the ABCs of the scripture and they get offended because they think they're way beyond that. We never grow beyond that, folks. We never grow beyond that. We should never tire of hearing someone tell us or him say the old, old story of Jesus and his love. I've met people like this. It's sad. The idea is that the youngest among them, the least mature among them, would be able to understand it. My friend Ernie Reisinger used to say to us when we, were, when we were getting ready for conferences, he would say, Bill, remember, you're feeding sheep, not giraffes. Put it down where people can get it. And you back up some more, back 800 years before Isaiah, God warned Israel in Deuteronomy 28, 49, the Lord will bring a nation against you from far away, from the end of the earth, swooping down like the eagle, a nation whose language you do not understand. Then if you move forward after Isaiah, 100 years after Isaiah, Jeremiah the prophet said in chapter 5, verse 15, Behold, I'm bringing against you a nation from afar, O house of Israel, declares the Lord. It's an enduring nation. It's an ancient nation, a nation whose language you do not know, nor can you understand what they say. So mark it down, brothers and sisters. When you're in a setting where something is spoken and you don't understand it, it doesn't line up with, with the principles of language, language given by our God who's a God of order, not a God of confusion. Or in that setting, if someone's not available to interpret, and we're going to get to experience this, God willing, at the end of March, end of February, 1st of March, when our friends from Haiti come. I appreciate the challenge Brother Norman and, and Linda have given us, and, and I want to try to do that too. But I'm going to tell you, if Pastor Joseph's not here, It'll be frustrating. It'll be frustrating. The importance of interpretation. The sign of judgment would be a, a language that they couldn't understand. If you find yourself in that setting, in a church setting, recognize it not as, as abounding, flourishing spiritual maturity, but as a sign of judgment from God upon that place. Acts 2, 7, 11, Pentecost. When this was happening, when they're descended upon that 120 from the upper room, cloven tongues like fire. And they spoke in the languages of the people gathered, not in multisyllabic, non intelligible gibberish. The response was, and they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? In other words, the Galilean tongue should not be able to articulate what I'm hearing. And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? 
Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, that is Jews and people who had become Jews, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues, here it is, the mighty works of God. That was the message conveyed. Why was that important? Because the gospel of Jesus Christ is the mightiest work of God. And this message came, and the Jews there should have recognized this as something of Babel reversed. They should have gone back in their teaching to when God sent a language to them that they didn't understand as a sign of his judgment upon them because they would not listen to his prophet. And here they are, Pentecost. They've crucified the Son of God. He's ascended on high. They've gathered. The Spirit falls now, as Jesus had promised he would come. Some years later, in 70 AD, the judgment of God fell with something of a finality for that time. When Jerusalem was utterly destroyed by the Roman general Titus, who would become Emperor Titus. Don't know if you're familiar with the history of this, but over one million Jews were slaughtered in that Roman occupation. Thousands more were taken captive. The temple was plundered, desecrated, destroyed. The rest of the city burned to the ground. That's what happened in 70 AD. That was the measure of God's judgment upon a people who rejected his Messiah. For 60 years, and we looked at this uh, in our study of the intertestamental period, you could say that, that Israel, uh, Jerusalem had no history, no effective history, no functioning history. Jesus wept over Jerusalem, remember. He said to them, you're going to be hemmed in on every side by your enemies. They will level you to the ground, your children within you. They will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. That was the judgment of God upon Israel. And so tongues are a a sign of judgment if there's no interpretation. But there also comes within this blessing. You remember as you study Old Testament, it's never simply judgment with God. Judgment that sees brings the people to turn back to God, and then blessing follows that. And the blessing you see in this gift of tongues at Pentecost is that God is now reaching out to all the nations. No longer will he work strictly through the Jews. No longer will he favor just one people, the Jews. But the church of Jesus Christ will be a gathering, the ecclesia, a gathering for people from every tribe and tongue, language under heaven. It'll be a place, according to Paul in Galatians 3, that there will not be Jew or Greek, slave nor free, male or female. Not abolishing those distinctions, but recognizing that those distinctions do not keep you out of the family of God. Paul recognizes this when he's writing to Rome and Romans. In that Romans 9, 10, and 11 section where he struggles with, with how, his, how could he personally have missed the idea, the reality that Jesus was the Messiah. How could he have committed himself to a mission going around to destroy the followers of Jesus? How could his brethren have missed it so much? But he comes to see this in Romans 11, 11 and 12. I can't develop the whole thing today. But he says, so I ask, did they stumble in order that they might fall? In other words, his his brethren missed it. His Jewish brethren missed it. By no means. Rather, through their trespass, through their crucifixion of Jesus, salvation has come to the Gentiles so as to make Israel jealous. 
Now, if their trespass, if their sin against God means riches for the world, the rest of the world brought in, if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their, their full inclusion mean? So he has this hope that just as God used the Jews to execute Jesus he will, and to, to fan the flames of the gospel to the nations, he will also come and, and bless the Jews. There's the hope of blessing when he says all Israel shall be saved. You look at Acts 10, 44 to 46, when the, when the gospel came to the Gentiles. Watch this difference now. When it came to the Jews at Pentecost, this thing of tongues, when it comes to the Gentiles, Acts 10, 44 to 46, while Peter was still saying these things, he's speaking in the house of Cornelius, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word, and the believers from among the circumcised, the, the Jewish Christians now, who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles, for they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. And so you see something of a reverse here. At, at, at Pentecost, the apostles speak, the crowd hears in their own language. It, this experience where Peter is speaking, the people in the home hear, and they begin to speak in languages that the Jewish Christians understand. It's, it's, it's an it's a interesting dynamic going on here. But it was a blessing. The gospel goes to the, to the Gentiles. Then a sign of authority. Those who preached the judgment and promised the blessing were the apostles and prophets whose authority was validated by these signs and wonders. Look at 2 Corinthians 12, 12. The signs of a true apostle were performed among you with utmost patience, with signs and wonders and mighty works. And in Romans 15, 19, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and all the way around to Illyricum, I fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. Paul talks about the, the signs. Paul, uh, my friend Walt Chantry wrote an excellent book called Signs of the Apostles, and he, he's addressing this, the role of uh, the remarkable gifts or the ecstatic gifts in the advance of the gospel. And so tongues becomes... The speaking of another language, having it interpreted, becomes uh, a sign uh, of the gospel advancing, the blessing of God upon the nations. And so it, it follows. As a sign, the purpose of tongues ended when that which was its purpose had ended. I, I think it was, it was one fellow I was reading said, when you're approaching a city, if you're, if you're driving... Uh, up the Indian Nation Turnpike, and you'll see a sign that says Tulsa, X number of miles. And then as you keep approaching, then the miles diminish. Tulsa, so many miles. And, and when you get into Tulsa, you don't see signs anymore that tell you how many miles it is to Tulsa. You're here. And that's the same analogy with the purpose of, the sign, of this sign gift. And then one writer observed that, that there's no record... For, given of a single word spoken in tongues or even interpreted. We have reams of what is prophesied, but not one recorded instance of a tongue's experience with its interpretation. Every reference to tongues is general, always mentioned in relation to the purpose of tongues and the significance of tongues never in relation to the specific content. The most we have is when we're told that it was about the mighty works of God, Acts 2, 11, the mighty deeds of God. But that's it. And it needs to be put into its context. The purpose of tongues was not to teach, it was to, to edify, it was to reveal God's truth, to validate the gospel. And I believe it was John MacArthur who said that since the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70, there's been no purpose for the sign gift of tongues. It fulfilled its purpose. 
But prophecy, he says in our text, is a sign, and that, that's, that's su- supported, by the way. That's why I didn't read it in the text. It's, it's implied. Prophecy is for those who believe, primarily, not exclusively. Unbelievers need to hear the gospel, and he goes on and talks about that in this text. But we're instructed. You're never instructed by tongues alone. An interpretation of tongues will tell you the content. When we get on farther in 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 31, Paul says, you can all prophesy one by one. He's talking about order in the church. We're going to look at that. So that all may learn and all may be encouraged. But he will, he will limit the expression of tongues to maybe three, and then only if there's an interpreter. He talks about the ungifted um, men or unbelievers enter. This idea uh, of folks coming in who don't know. I, I told you, I think it was last week, that the word in the Greek here is idiotes. We get our word idiot from that. Idiot in its, in its original form is not a pejorative term. It becomes that in our culture. But it's someone that, that's, that's not gifted, not, not enabled. It's unlearned, ignorant. And he says in our text here that if Outsiders or unbelievers enter, will they not say that you're all mad out of your minds? Folks, you have to superimpose upon everything you read in the Scripture the reality that the God who inspired the Scripture is a God of order and decency, not a God of confusion. He doesn't operate that way. All the false gods of the worlds bring confusion. Not the true and living God. He brings order out of chaos. The same God who said, let there be in Genesis, continues to operate that way with his people. We need to think in terms of our worship, and we'll get into this as we get farther into 1 Corinthians 14, that it needs to be undertaken in such a way that, that we're speaking plainly and clearly about the truth to those who are here because they have committed to be a part of the body of Christ, in anticipation of those coming among us who are not yet followers of Christ. One of the things we do not do here, we never have, never will, as long as I'm alive, we do not order our services for unbelievers. We order our services for those who have been saved by grace through faith, recognizing that at any moment there are unbelievers sitting among us. But we don't design that. We design it for those that we can speak edification, exhortation, rebuke, challenge, content that you can grow as a disciple of Jesus Christ. And when outsiders, when unbelievers come among us, Paul says in this text, verse 44, if all prophesy and an unbeliever or outsider enters, he's convicted by all, by what he hears. When you gather for worship, you ought to pray this. God, may every word spoken in our service today challenge and strengthen me as a follower of Christ, encourage my brothers and sisters, and then, Lord, we have unbelievers among us. We've brought our unbelieving children among us. We're going to have friends and neighbors. You're going to bring people we've never met among us. Lord, may our words sung and spoken, whether in greeting them in singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, when our pastor stands to preach, may all these words have the effect of convicting of sin. There are people out there that say, well, we need to make folks feel comfortable. I, I'm not interested in people feeling comfortable. I'll leave that to the work of the Holy Spirit who is the comforter. When he comforts somebody, they're comforted. Bill Askell tries to order things in such a way to make people comfortable. I'm I'm sinning against them, and I may well pave the way to hell for them. Paul's speaking to this here. He's he's called to account by all. We should pray. I hope you're praying before you come to church. We should pray, dear God, may my very conduct, disposition, 
If I brush up against someone who's not yet a follower of Christ, whether that's one of the children of our, of our members or whether it's someone you brought among us, may that have the effect of convicting of sin. May the truth we preach and sing here have the effect by the Spirit of exposing the secrets of the heart. And Oh, I long for this, brothers and sisters. One of the biggest concerns I have as a pastor is they will go through the motions. They will come in here complacent. They will decide that there's something more important going on and, and leave one after another, family after family. This is an insult to the living God. We don't want to be complacent. I don't want to go through the motions. I have no desire to do this because we did this last Sunday. What I do desire is for God to look upon our gathering, see the sincerity of our hearts, the intensity of our commitment, our determination to advance the gospel locally and around the world and come in power by His Holy Spirit dealing with us as each of us needs to be dealt with. I long for the day when people fall on their face, not because of what I've said, but because they've met God here. Did you come here today for that? Why'd you come? Why'd you come? You've got to ask yourself that. Scripture calls upon us to examine ourselves. But oh, if you came to worship God, if you came to hear the Word of God, if you came willing as a follower of Christ to open your heart and say, search me, O Lord, and try my ways and my thoughts and see if there's anything in me that needs to be cleansed, God will meet you there. Did you pray, coming praying, Lord, let the power of God fall upon our preacher? Spurgeon said one of the greatest fears he had was he would stand to preach and people were not praying for him. I tremble about that. This is very different. What Paul is saying here is very different from the prevailing notions of today. He's very much in line with the writer of the Hebrews. Hebrews 4.12, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. That's as, folks, that's as fine a cut as you can make. And the Word of God discerns the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Here it is, folks. Whether you know my thoughts and intentions or not, the Word of God has cut them open before God today. Whether I know your thoughts and intentions or not, the Word of God has cut them open before God today. And we ought to pray, dear God, don't let us meet complacently. Don't let us meet with the distraction of these, of these silly things that the Corinthians were involved in. Let us meet sober, serious, joyful, as we sang earlier. Joyful that we have a Savior. Joyful that one has come and lived and kept your whole law, which I, I did not do before he saved me. I have not done. Oh God. Help me to have joy in a Christ who lived and died and rose again. One of our little boys asked me last Sunday evening after we decorated our facility here. He said, Brother Bill, what's that? I said, well, that's, that's a replica represents the manger where Jesus when he was born was laid in a cattle trough he said why isn't there a baby there I loved it I was hoping he'd ask it 
I thought that's a great question. There's not a baby there because he didn't remain a baby. And folks, you're going to meet people this season who are fascinated by that event. They're fascinated to know that a baby came, but I want to tell you something, he's not a baby now. He grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. He went to a cross and hung there for sinners. And he rose from the grave, proving that everything he taught was true. Everything he said was true. Everything he promised was true. Every prediction he made was true. And he's ascended on high. And he is ruling and reigning at the right hand of God. And he is coming back. And he's not coming back as a baby to be placed in something like that. He's coming back, Revelation 19 says. We'll look at this tonight. He's King of kings and Lord of lords. And he will trample under his feet like so many grapes in a vat of wine. The people who are his enemies. And I want you to know something. They're church members who are his enemies. Because they've joined themselves to a church, but they hadn't joined themselves to Christ. Because Christ is not all in all. He is not their all. He's an eternal fire insurance policy that they they hope will keep them out of hell. He's an eternal life insurance policy that they hope will get them to heaven. But he's not their all. He's not their all. The return of Jesus Christ will not be anything to be fascinated about, like the birth of Jesus Christ. The return of Jesus Christ will, as one writer said, will will blow history out like a candle and roll it up like a scroll. And those who are not prepared for him, those who have not come to him, those who have not lived for him will not live with him. And he will separate Sheep from goats. I ask you, why'd you come today? Why'd you come today? Oh, get in the habit of asking yourself that. And prepare your heart. That's what Paul's concern is with Corinth. Is they're not, their heart's not in it. May the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Jesus who came to earth, born in Bethlehem as a baby, may that gospel grip you, change you, and turn gathering in his name, not as something we approach with convenience on our terms, but gathering in his name to come in his presence to experience his glory, his holiness, his mercy. And go forth prophesying, speaking the truth about who Jesus Christ is, what he came to do, and offering hope to those who will receive him on his terms and warning of eternal destruction and damnation to all who think they can have him on their terms. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, help me today. Help me today. I'm vexed. I'm vexed. We need you. We need you to capture our attention, our whole attention. Lord, we need you to deliver us from trivialities, deliver us from distorting the gospel of your grace, making it something it's not like the Corinthians did making it less than it is. Oh, Lord, purify here a people for you. 
Cleanse us, fill us, renew us, use us, and deliver us from thinking we can play church with you because your word pierces us to the very core of our being. We make our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to stand and sing before we.